Hey everybody, this is Darwin Reina, the festival director of the Northfield Festival right here in Sweden, Stockholm. We do it online this year, 24 to 26, and today we have another great filmmaker from the US. He made this beautiful work, Bizarre Fantastico, and we have Chris. How are you, Chris? I'm doing very well, thank you. How are you? Good, good. I'm doing also excellent to have you. Thank you for being with us. He's the director of this wonderful movie. Tell me, Chris, the idea. It's, it's, how do you, how do you, how do you come up with this idea? Because it's pretty cool, actually. Oh, well, thank you. Um, well, you know, so I kind of am preoccupied by the same ideas, you know, dying and death. It sounds like a very dark type of thing, but you have to have some type of sense of humor about it. So I knew I wanted to make a movie uh, early on about the kind of relationship we have with death and some people fear it and some people uh you know have a faith that helps them cope with this idea but it's always hanging above all of us but the thing is is that to make for a very good movie so i just got to thinking of what is a way to make this entertaining and interesting and original and i remembered uh how the, i remember the cliche of the french having such rich food and it always is tough on american digestive systems because we're not accustomed to their their better cuisine, their their higher quality cuisine. And so I thought, well, what if death in this version consumes a soul and he gets food poisoning from the soul? And I thought, okay, well, there's a movie that now we have a movie. Now I can make that. That's a story. And that's kind of how it all came together. So from my desire to tell a dark story about death and philosophy and art, and then I thought, okay, well, I should put some farts in there. And, and that's kind of how we <laughs> that's how it kind of that's how it kind of went. Right. How long was the process of writing the script? Yeah. Chris, do you remember, how, do you do many drafts? How, how was that process? Well, so I, uh, I write, I mean, I, really where I began as a filmmaker was as a writer in my youth. I've wanted to be a filmmaker since I was very young. Mm -hmm. So I didn't have always, didn't always have the materials to make films. So I focused really on screenplays. So uh, the screenplay for Bizarro, well, briefly, Bizarro in general was kind of like a magic lightning bolt type of project because I was actually going to be in Rome uh, trying to raise financing for another film, a feature film called Madame X. And it, you know, it was a year-long process, going, you know, go, flying around the world and taking meetings. This is for COVID, of course. And so I'm you know, waiting for emails and phone calls, and they wouldn't come, or they were interested, but then they weren't, and you know, all this stuff. So I decided well, I'm going to be in Rome, one of my favorite cities in the world, and I'm going to be in France, I'm going to be in Paris, one of my other favorite cities. I'm going to make a movie. And so I wrote a script. And I, once I kind of unlocked that idea, like I mentioned, once I kind of cracked the idea, I wrote one draft and that was the, it took probably about two weeks, I think, to, right. to put together. And right. uh, then we shot that exact, I had to get a transcript, don't speak short Italian, which is kind of an insane story, yeah, but exactly. uh, I had it translated and then. Hey, Chris, how was that? So you speak Italian? No. Wow, man, this is, wow, this is very interesting, man. Wow, so yeah. how, do you, how do you manage to, okay, we get there later to the, to the production. Wait, I have more questions. Uh, okay, okay, how, sorry. How is your process for pre-production, especially for, for this film? Do you do, 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 you do a storyboards, script, uh, script breakdowns, lo uh, scouting location? How is your process for, for pre-production, especially for this uh, film? For Bizarro, fantastic. Uh, yeah, so there, this this film is really unique. I mean, I, I usually work with a team of people that I'm you know I'm designing things with and being collaborative with. That's really one of the great joys of filmmaking is working with a team. Mm -hmm. With Bizarro, I was my only crew member in product in the production phase, but also the pre production phase. So no one was doing anything. I just had to right. reach you know do everything. So I'm very fortunate that I have a very visual mind and. I was able to imagine the shots as they were written. Mm -hmm. And the film was kind of pre-edited in my mind. Uh, the only thing that took time was to really work out the locations, of course. Uh, mm -hmm. I've been fortunate because I had been to Rome a handful of times previous. And I was, you know, like a, it was a kind of a city that had kind of worked its way into my heart. And I was a big you know, lover of the city and had, had walked the streets you know, for hours and hours. So I kind of had a sense of geography about it. And that helped a lot. And uh, after that, the hardest part was finding the actors, finding the performers. So that's really thanks to the Internet. Uh, mm -hmm. I reached out for the French actors. I reached out to um, a 
French acting school that specialized in English speaking filmmakers or mm -hmm. actors, performers. That way I could communicate with them and asked, I said, hey, I'm an American filmmaker and I'm coming uh, and we have 48 hours and does anyone want to be a part of a movie? And uh, the instructor of that course sent me a list of wonderful people. I reached out and everyone was just so you know collaborative and, and, and excellent. So wow. really it's like a miracle. So production, wow. pre-production was, uh, you know, fingers crossed, I'm gonna be there on these days. Can I make this movie in that amount of time? And it worked out unbelievably. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah oh yeah. yeah. Definitely, man. I'm just yeah. watching it here. It's, I mean, it's, it's you're very creative. You know, I can really oh. say that for sure. Tell me, the, the actors are really good, actually. The, the, the older mm -hmm. men, I like him very much. The young guy, too. They really yes. connect. Uh, how many days of the production do you, do you do? And how do you direct Italians? Mm -hmm. You know, you're well, American. So, this is interesting. I need to know. <laughs> yeah, no, no. It's again, it's kind of a, like I said, I, I'm not sure I've been miracles, but if I, this movie maybe proved me wrong, I think there might be miracles because it was just kind of a, I mean, really, it was their work ethic. It was their professionalism. It was their work ethic. It was their talent that really allows the movie to shine. And so, we're going to touch on the, the last phase of pre production is that we had to have them translated. So again, just by the stroke of, of luck, uh, I had a, a gentleman that was from the neighborhood in Rome uh, called Trastevere. And as you are well aware, as most countries in Europe, the dialects are so, they vary so much from place mm -hmm. to place that even by neighborhood or by region, or it's, it's not just, oh, everyone speaks Italian, everybody speaks French. There's all these kind all of right. regional, you know, so I wanted it to be authentic. And that was kind of my whole goal in the first place was to pay tribute to these Italian and French films that I admire and, and that inspired me. And that's why I wanted to do it in a different language in the first place was to be authentic to those films. Right. So anyway, so I got this translator who just happened to be from the same neighborhood. And his name is Aroni and he and I collaborated. We sat line by line together and we went through every single line of dialogue for hours and hours and hours and we got it translated. And so once I found the Italian actors, which that's also very interesting story. Cosimo, the, the younger general, the everyman, he is actually uh, part of my family. And so oh. I, I've always, he, he's an actor. He's an Italian actor and a musician and a very creative person. And so he was like my anchor. He was the first per person I knew was going to be in this thing. And he helped me find the older gentleman, Roberto. And they had been in an acting class together years earlier, wow. I think like 20 years earlier. And he spoke no English at all, Roberto, zero except for hello and you know those things so cosimo who is learning english and is pretty decent at it he would help me translate uh and so to answer your direct question it took about five days to shoot the italian sequences it took one night to shoot the parisian sequences so the total and I would direct and i would act things out i would try to emote visually to show them kind of what the scene needed cosimo would then come in and kind of articulate that for roberto and they would just nail it. Uh, and also too, the other challenge is I didn't know if they were saying the lines correctly. So right. I, I told them, I said, you have to say it exactly as it's written. You can, there cannot be one word that's changed because I won't be able to edit the film. I have no mm -hmm. idea what you're saying. And so it, was, it wasn't until months later that I brought the translator back in and we went line by line film and he confirmed that the act had hit every line exactly as they were written. Wow. So five wow. days of those guys being perfect and wonderful and professional and i mean they they made the movie possible definitely they are re I, I i enjoy watching them you know that they are funny they just say uh, they're so glue into it you know uh, so yeah which is it's great yeah what uh, what do you think it was besides the language i guess that was challenging for you what else was challenging during the production time that you remember chris what do you think challenging was that again i was my only crew member so i was directing the film wow. but i was also operating camera i was running sound i was setting oh light God. all on you know. and so and the thing is like i said it's i i don't want to make it seem like uh that i'm the best cinematographer i usually work with wonderful people and so i missed them i wished they were there with me to collaborate but you know there was kind of a sick pleasure of not being able to have to you know tell anybody anything i was just you know if i had an idea i just did it and then then i'm on the line you know it's like if good it's good if it's bad it's bad i'm the only one that I, that you can blame not that anyone blames anyone else than a director anyway but um but yeah that was the most challenging was just the the kind of 
the getting it made, you know, long mm-hmm. days, you know, I think, like I said earlier, I had every shot kind of planned in my mind. Right. And so I just shot the shots so there was almost no coverage. So I didn't get, I didn't get variants in any shots. I just shot what was in my mind. And then when we edited the film, we put it together and it, and it worked. So that, that comes from experience that comes from obsessively thinking visually and connecting the dots. So the hardest part was just the real mechanics of it you know like lifting the lights and lifting the camera and making sure the settings were correct and also trying to be creative trying to keep even though it was very rigid because of all these you know trapped these all these problems I still wanted it to be a collaborative experience where we were adding to the experience as we went and making it better and that I think the actors would agree that we achieved that as well so the whole thing was in hindsight I don't even know how we did it Wow, yeah, <laughs> one main crew. Imagine that, Chris. Yeah. Wow, this is, and this is really good, actually. You know, that is like, I was expecting yeah, people was behind it, a lot of people, you know. <laughs> yes, because it's really well done, actually. So uh, oh, thank you. you mentioned before, Chris, how do you, how do you get the feeling the actors were doing what you, what you wanted? Even though we know they don't, they don't speak the same language, right? Uh, sure. You 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 felt it or you see it? How how was that that uh, directing to to them? Yeah, I think it had a lot to do. I mean, I, I I'm not the most experienced director in the world. There's a lot of people that have made many more projects at much higher levels than I. But I've been working in this field all my life. Yeah, you know, mm-hmm. and I think I've I've honed an instinct uh, right. that I could feel it. You know, the, the biggest thing about that I'm really proud of in Bizarro and with the actors in particular is they were able to, in a short film, which typically is so limiting just for time and, you know, mm-hmm. the, the yeah. sophistication of the story and what you can achieve, they really tapped into a subtlety and a nuance and a kind of a connection between those two characters. And uh, you could feel that. I mean, when you're filming it, uh, I would try to really, you know, get everything in place, and then I'd have a large monitor so I could really sit and I could watch them. And I was never two feet away from them anyway, and I could really uh, take it in. And I, even on the set, I could feel them connecting, and I could feel that kind of that um, energy in the air where something going on. Here. Hopefully, they're saying it right, but I could feel that it's right, and yeah. so that's that's what kept us going. Yeah, Chris, was there any moment in the production time that you feel like giving up, or not really? Because you were no. by yourself, no, you were. <laughs> I'm a, I'm a weirdo. Like I'm a really intense guy, and right. uh, this is my greatest passion. And I, that's the thing is, like I said, I was kind of there for other business reasons, and Bizarro kind of happened and kind of came to life. And I thought, well, if it's terrible, I just won't show anybody. You know, if, it is, if it's you know, if I if I mess this up and everything is horrible, then I have a great vacation in Rome. It'd be some great vacation footage. Uh, and so, no, we, we kept uh, a very, I think, again, thanks to Cosimo. He, he cooked us meals every night. He was, the, oh. he was a consummate uh, host. I mean, he would he had champagne delivered. We were all there having fun. And as much hard as it, as much work as it was, it was a lot of work. But I'm going to get into this mode where I'm really doing what I love. I'm, that's, I'm doing what I'm most passionate about. And I knew I had something special if it worked, you know, if this, if this, if we pull it off, it's going to be something really unique here. And so we just had a blast together and I never thought about quitting. I only was like, mm-hmm. couldn't wait to get home and edit it. Wow. Everybody, you listen, right? We can't quit. That's right. Never give up, in the, especially in our industry. And when we're independent, no. it's not easy. We all know that, but we have to keep pushing. That's pretty good. Uh, Chris, tell me, uh, let's go to post-production. Who okay. edited the film and how do you how do you work with the editor? How do you manage to get your ideas into his ideas and you know make the, mm-hmm. the whole train go? Tell me. Okay, so this was a great experience, actually. This is one of the most kind of profound experiences of, of the whole thing. Is when I came back, I didn't have an editor. So I just had memory cards, you know, with footage on it. And I thought, okay, well, I need to find someone. And through a mutual friend, I got connected to a guy named Brian Paulson. Brian Paulson and I have become really close friends and close collaborators, and it really all came from the process of Bizarro. So in the middle of editing Bizarro was the COVID-19 pandemic. And so it was very slow going. Obviously, we'd, at first, we didn't know if we could even be physically near each other. So we were doing Zoom and this, you know, all these different things. Eventually, we sat down together, and just he and I 
we chiseled this thing kind of stone. And, you know, it's funny because I mentioned that I had all these shots and I barely shot any coverage, but that's not to take away from the challenge of editing and getting the pace perfect. Mm -hmm. yeah. And Brian and I just spent hours and hours and we did a, I think we did over 70 hours of editing. Uh, and then of course, Brian also did the coloring, which is something that is the, one of the most profound, th I think it's one of the most beautiful aspects and things mm -hmm. people remember uh, is the color. And that's Brian working, mastering that. And if from the original fridge to what it is now is almost inconceivable. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, so we just sat side by side together uh, for, through an entire pandemic basically and chiseled away and talked and collaborated. And well, I'm very communicative as you can probably tell. I love it. I like to talk. It doesn't, doesn't bother me any. So he and I would just chat and talk and watch films together and talk about pacing mm -hmm. and tone and atmosphere. And we just eventually kind of came together and then the little last tidbit of that, which is interesting, is that he didn't speak Italian either. So for the oh, first, so for the first two or three months, months of the movie, he didn't know what he was editing, he had no mm -hmm. idea. And so I had a script, the English script, and I had the Italian translated script, and we would edit phonetically. So we would go, okay, this is the word he's saying, and this is the word mm -hmm. in the script, wow. and this is where I shot the, you know, and put it together that way, and then. Three months later, we brought the translator back in, like I said earlier, and he confirmed that it was right. And for the first time, I was able to put subtitles in. And Brian and his wife, Katie, we were all got together and we were able to watch the movie for the first time. And they, they finally understood what we'd been working on, you know, blood, with blood, sweat and tears for three months. Wow. wow. <laughs> Amazing, man. I'm really impressed. You know, I saw, I saw Chris is Italian, so how he speaks Italian, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but wow, this is a trip. No. This is a this is a uh, this is an adventure, huh? Wow! But it, it oh, turned yeah. out very good because I mean, you've been successful with this film. Actually, I've been following you a little bit, checking all the mm -hmm. festivals you've been. Uh, how do you guys decide the master, the the final master? What I'm seeing right now. Uh, do you get feedback? You share it to people, or is something very personal to you? The decision of of the final master. What do you think? Um. Yeah, I think all. all it's very personal. I don't think we didn't really take any notes from outside. I think it was Brian and I and our executive producer, Dylan Gallagher, a longtime collaborator of mine. He's a great writer. I worked on big shows like Daredevil and Carnival Row for Amazon. And he and I go way, way back. And he was an executive producer on the film. And so us three, I think, really decided this is, this is it. You know, one of the things that was the biggest conversation was the Black Minute, was that minute of, of death preview. And how long should that be? And I love, I, I wanted it to be 25 minutes. And I wanted people to think <laughs> it was over and go home. You know, because I like to push, you know, people that way. Thankfully, those guys brought me back to, to sanity. And so I said, okay, well, maybe it's 30 seconds. And maybe it's, you know, we really settled on the minute because that felt like that was, you know, it was like, it was a comment. It was, a, it was, a, it was an artistic decision, but it wasn't too long. And so, it, so those, like, those kind of conversations we had between the three of us, uh, um, and what was finally together, it's right. You know, I think mm -hmm. once we cracked the color, the movie came together, came to life. Right. Um, and we thought that's, that's the film. And then we just released it. Uh, and we actually kept private for a year because of the, because we wanted to do more in-person festivals. Obviously mm -hmm. I wanted to be a part of your festival, even though it was going to be remote because I was just, yeah. I've followed you guys and I'm very uh, proud and excited to be in your films. Um, but the main goal, yeah, of course, absolutely. But the main goal was to be uh, there. I wanted to go to these places and show people and talk to people and get them excited, as excited as I am. And so we waited. And in that time, we showed only like our closest collaborators, friends, professional friends, family, and we got feedback there. Right. But yeah, it's been an amazing festival journey. So it's been very, yes. very successful. So Definitely. it's very, very humbling. You were expecting all that success? What do you think? Oh, no, really? <laughs> Um, well, it's well done. And you also I, have your collaborators. <laughs> so yeah, you might expect that because you yeah. have some collaborators I mean, and it's really well done. Well, thank you. I really pre I appreciate that. I think that um, I knew it was good. You know what I mean? But you don't always know that anyone else. And I like to take risks. And the biggest thing is, is I want to make, I want to to the world and I want to tell interesting challenging stories which alienates some people sometimes I, I wish that wasn't the case I, I never want to make films that are feel like they're alienating people I, I, I try to make this film especially there's kind of a hopefully a warmth 
and a, and a friendliness and a beauty about it that brings people in, even though it has some challenging and ideas about it or that might split some people's opinions. It's supposed to be beautiful and welcoming. And so I didn't really know. I thought maybe this was going to be one of those great little movies that no one connected with and maybe we would just be really proud of it and but I'm just over you know I'm so pleased that people are connecting with it that's really the goal and so all over the world people are really becoming passionate about it and that's so meaningful to us right Chris tell me about the music I love the music of your film too pretty European you know how do you choose that that music is something you you it was in your mind before when you were back in Italy or something that came into into the editing room what do you think was uh, yeah, that's actually a combination. So sometimes I know a piece of music before, and you know, I kind of there's a, a song by a 1960s kind of a French pop experimental uh, guy named Andre Pop, and he is a person I've listened to most of my life, big fan. So I kind of knew that that was going to be in the film, and then it only like that we picked uh, music from some of Fellini's films as a reference to him in that era of movies. There's a piece of music from mm -hmm. his short film called Toby Dammit, which begins, it's kind of, when I looked at, not to go on a little tangent, but I want to make the best short film I could make, right? I think I want to respect the medium of short films. Sometimes short films feel like a, a feature film squashed down, yeah. or sometimes feature films feel like a short film stretched out. So I really wanted to make the perfect short. And so I studied Toby Dammit, I studied the Red Balloon films that I felt were masterful in their medium. And so that's kind of how it brought, led me to Toby Dammit. And that was one of the reasons I chose that music was as an ode to that film, which had kind of like a North Star for us. Um, and that's it. So yeah, I mean, some was, like I said, I knew about Andre. I wanted to put him in the film from the very beginning. And then at the during the editing process, I also searched. And my main goal was to have it kind of feel like that mid-century European art film of 1950s 1960s of like a Fellini Pasolini yeah exactly like the intro of your film you know it's like get you like in the <laughs> 60s 70s yeah 50s yeah. correct that's a cool intro tell me uh, Chris what so what do you learn out of making a bizarro what do you think what is the takeaway for for you I learned so much as a craftsperson because I had to be you know, I had I was the only guy there so I learned so much about hand-on craft movie that was very wonderful i think those are lessons i'll take into my next films uh, and hopefully make a better collaborator mm -hmm. uh and then the other thing that i learned uh i in this movie really i've always felt this but this movie i think proved it to me which is just be honest and sincere what you want to put into the world and you don't get it, everyone to like it. And if you're really sincere about it, then more people will respond to it. I think a lot of people, you know, like this movie is easy. There's, it's in a different language for any of the viewers, or the Italians, but else. Uh, not everyone loves subtitles. There's a black minute in the center of it. You know, people, people could check their phone. Or, so it's not the easiest <laughs> movie. It's not designed to be the most successful film ever. It's not designed to have made toys made out of it and stuff. So my, my idea is just be honest and sincere mm -hmm. and don't try to alienate people, try to bring people in, uh, even if it's an interesting or weird or challenging idea and they will come. And this little movie that uh, was, you know, that has a lot of ideas in it, uh, Really responding to so just be honest with yourself truthful with yourself as an artist it sounds like a cliche but it's good advice i think right chris what do you think if feedback is important it's important to listen it which is more important to go with your own guts and do the movie you want to do or adjust to the feedback that you get what do you think about that because you are really you're a really filmmaker i can see that mm -hmm. what do you think thank you well you know it's i think it depends on what type of film you want to be. If you want to be Steven Spielberg and you want to be able to own real estate and space, then you have to be willing to make car commercials sometimes. And that's just the reality of the business. Like what I love about filmmaking is you have Igmar Bergman on one end and you have Michael Bay on the other end. And uh -huh. it's not it's not a different medium, right. the same medium, the same thing. So just you have to pick, you know, either have a small career i'd love to live and work in europe and i think that's where people understand my work more mm -hmm. and i'd love to be able to get there at some point and i you know oh god uh, god forbid i'm worth only a little bit of money and i can only make films for a living and oh how sad you know that that's the, that's the dream i'd love mm -hmm. to write plays and you know make my living and that's it so 
if you want to do that, then I think be uncompromising. I think, and there's a difference. It's a very nuanced answer. I don't want to ram, but essentially it's like, you know, you don't want to be uncompromising uh, with everybody and you want to work with people, but I think you should be honest with your vision and straight with your vision. And if you want to make some money, you could do that too. Uh, and just be a gun for hire. That that option is there within the industry. That's just not something I'm particularly interested in. I'd rather make smaller movies that reach smaller uh, audiences, but have more of a profound impact. And mm-hmm. I think that does exist. Just have to find it. Right. So right. Yeah. Beautiful answer. Hey, my last question, Chris. Hey, mm-hmm. What do you think uh, is the hardest part in filmmaking? We have three phases, pre-production, production, and post-production. We need all of them, you know, to work perfectly. But we, which one is the hardest mm-hmm. one, you think, of the three? Uh, I always feel like I'm giving two answers, sorry. Basically, the hardest part is telling a good story. I mean, the hardest part is coming up with something mm-hmm. that is interesting and well executed. Like, I think that most films the problems with most films is their storytelling you know right. if you look at a Holly, mainstream hollywood movie they're all made beautifully they're mm-hmm. i mean the craftsmanship of them is excellent Excellent. very good movies but, so mm-hmm. hardest part's telling a good story for sure all right that's a good answer i'm watching this beautiful you take us to italy i'm watching the plaza <laughs> what's the name with the water it's a beautiful shot which camera oh, do you yeah. like What's the name of this plaza? I forgot. Uh, oh, Piazza Novan. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Which, the Fountain of Four Rivers. Yeah, yeah beautiful, yeah. man. I'm a which, big Bernini which, fan. Which camera do you use, if we can know? <laughs> it's beautiful, man. Yeah, I kind of I, I kept it a secret. All right, keep it there's, a secret. There's, well, there's a lot of people. I'll say this. There's a lot of people who think it's really shot on film. And it isn't. It's shot digitally. And mm-hmm. we spent a lot of time, especially in the covering phase, to get it to look like an authentic film so yeah, that, studied. Yeah. That's, that's where my question coming from because yeah, it looks very filmy, you know? Oh good. Pretty, we yeah. spent, I mean that's a that's a trap because you can you, know, you can buy a little film thing and put it on, it just looks cheesy. Mm-hmm. So we really struggled with, you know, that film that we the kind of film grain is a is an actually scanned 6k piece of film stock that we were able mm-hmm. to get real film stock so that wow. gave it a certain authenticity um and we also wanted it to be kind of banged up and damaged there's scratches uh-huh. and yeah, just the sound it kind of gets all off a little and that was I wanted it to feel like an uh, maybe a lost movie of that mm-hmm. time you know like a movie that, that was in the 1960s but someone left it in their trunk and then we found the 35 millimeter film reel you know something you know, something like that so we did a lot of that stuff but no it was shot digitally uh and i was a small camera i was able to fit in a suitcase i brought all the equipment from america right. so everything i shot the film with was the suitcase and uh so it was small and digital but we just worked really hard to make it look for that film wow man if you if you done this i can do my film in nicaragua more or less the same way for sure oh yeah you, know? it, you could do anything yeah, exactly. yeah just do it exactly yeah, it's just true. be a crazy ambitious fool like I yeah. had no idea how hard it was going to be. And that was what made me do it. I, if you know right. how, how insane it is, then you'll never even try it. But just stay ignorant and go yeah. shoot. That's cute. Chris, my, my last question. Well, how can we get in touch with you? You know, other filmmakers from the festival, from the North Hill Festival. How can we interact sure. with you? You have an Instagram website that you can share with us. Yeah, so my main website, although that's not, I don't really correspond there, but it's kind of where you can see all my work. It's Chris Cranock, K R I S K R A I N O C K dot com. You're going to be able to find everything there. But add me on social media Facebook, Instagram, it's just my first and last name. Mm-hmm. And that's where I'm really interacting more and I'm showing you know, what we're doing on our film festival journey. So if you'd like to follow along or learn more about my next film, what we're already working on, uh, go ahead and follow me. We're, I mean, I'm going to follow you right away. You impress me, buddy. <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, thank you. I really appreciate the chance to chat with you. So thank you very much. So listen, uh, if I don't see you in Stockholm, I'm going to see you for sure in Barcelona because uh, your film is oh, also I'm gonna, there. I'm, gonna, I'm going. Yeah, yes, we're gonna be playing we have a great there festival there. there. Yes, we uh, have a beautiful have a festival. Absolutely. Buddy, listen, thank you so much huh, for your time. I appreciate this thank conversation. You. Same. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you, Chris. Bye-bye. Mm-hmm. Bye-bye.